You ready? Okay. Right. Hello, everyone. Uh, we're absolutely delighted to be here today at London Serverless Days, uh, especially in such a fantastic uh, place like this. And I've just seen the organ up there. Isn't that magnificent? Yeah, you can't, everyone should just turn around and have a quick look at that. Anyway, um, I digress. That wasn't in the rehearsal. Okay. Um, yeah, we've got lots to share with you today and uh, not a lot of time to do that, so uh, let's go. Uh, firstly, let me introduce to you Blanca Garcia-Gill. Blanca is a senior software engineer at the BBC, and uh, amongst her many claims to fame at the BBC, bits of software that she's written, she's written the Recryptor, which is at the heart of every BBC secure message that goes around our personalization services. That was quite a mouthful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so this is Neil Crofts. Uh, he's a colleague of mine, and his claim to fame is that he put the football scores on telly in the teletext. Absolutely <laughs> true. Yeah, check, check the red button. Yeah, yeah. okay. Right. So, yeah, Neil and I work together in the same team at the BBC, and we work within the personalization area. Okay, so our day-to-day, -day, we are responsible for ingesting billions of messages from different sources and process them and make them available downstream for our stakeholders to analyze and understand what the behavior of our audience is around BBC websites. And the important part of this is that we're using this data to try to provide a better quality of service for our users, okay, and make more decisions based on actual data and not what we kind of feel like. And yeah, one of the key things about this talk is how, how do you handle change in your applications as your kind of software progresses and as your architecture changes over time? Okay, all right. Uh, but before we sort of dive into our first of our recipes of the day, uh, we're going to talk about uh, a couple of sort of fairly important questions. So in BBC terms, you might ask, why, oh, why, oh, why are we actually doing all this sort of personalization stuff? Why are we actually asking you and you and you to sign in and hand over some of your personal data to the BBC? So we have a privacy promise, okay, with our users and has two parts. So. For me, as an individual, if I register for an account with the BBC, I will be asked for very important personal information, such as what is your email address, what is your postcode, what is your date of birth. And by me tr trusting the BBC to hold that data securely, I will get access to a more personalized service and things such as personalized recommendations and perhaps suggestions of services that the BBC has and I had not discovered before. Okay, all right. So that's what's in it for you as an individual. So it's a fairly sort of simple sort of contract between you and uh, the BBC. But what's in it for the organization? And no matter what organization, there's always something in it for the organization. So, so what's in it for the BBC? Well, um, essentially the BBC, public rem it's got a public remit, uh, public uh, duty to provide information, not just to you as individuals, but to learn about the everybody and make sure that everybody is actually sort of being well serviced by the BBC's content. So by studying essentially the gaps in the, in the uh, information that we get back from individuals, we can actually make sure that everybody gets a fair crack at the whip. And uh, basically, no matter where you live in the country, where you live in the world even, but also uh, no matter your economic background or whatever, just basically, it's got to be fair. Okay. Um, but there is a dark side to personalization, and we don't want to shy away from that. And if you'd permit us to paraphrase the words of an ex-colleague of ours, uh, and Eric Blair, uh, who you may know better as George Orwell. Uh, basically, for the, the avoidance of doubt, I want to make it very clear that the BBC is definitely not watching you in an Orwellian sense. We are definitely not selling on your data to third parties who will then sell, sell you stuff that you didn't even know you wanted. Um, and we are most definitely not misusing your data to try and... Uh, change the outcome of an election. I, I believe it may have been done. <laughs> okay. Right. So taking things back into personalization, there is what we call the acceptable phase of personalization. So it's a bit of a gray scale. And on one end, there's like the positive side of things where you feel that as a user, your relationship with uh, the company that holds your data is transparent and you're getting benefit from it. And then there is a darker side of it where sometimes you're 
happen to be browsing the internet and you switch between different sites and somehow you feel that they are connected in ways that you're not entirely aware of and you begin to feel very creeped out and questions pop into mind as to what is happening and why I'm not being told about this upfront. So we're going to leave to you as an exercise, where would you praise the different kind of uh, online services that you use? We definitely try to be more on the Doctor Who end with the positive and yeah, I'll leave it there. <laughs> okay, all right, okay, so without any more ado, let's get on with our first recipe, which is architecture. Uh, now, okay, we've got a bit of a confession here. Uh, the first version of our software, well, how, how would you sum it up, Blanca? Well, I'm, I'm going to be a bit British, okay? <laughs> and I'm going to say okay. it wasn't quite as good as we hoped it would be. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Who'd have thought that? A first version that wasn't quite up to scratch. So, okay, so we definitely had a good reason to say hasta la vista to that piece of software. Okay. Uh, so, um, but to understand why we want to get rid of it, you need to know a little bit about it. Okay, so what we have here is we have a number of data processing pipelines uh, that basically have the same shape, roughly. Uh, they all ingest some data from one of either an internal BBC service uh, or uh, a third-party web analytics service. And then that data is enriched. Now, if you're not familiar with big data, uh, enrichment is essentially a process of taking a raw bit of data, such as, for example, a postcode, and then enhancing that with additional third-party sort of data so that you can kind of infer things such as uh, the sort of social uh, or economic uh, background of someone at that particular approximate location. Okay. Uh, and then that enriched data is basically dumped into a large uh, distributed data store, something like S3 is, uh, is a good source for that. Uh, and then that data lake, portions of the, the interesting most, the most interesting portions of that data are then pushed into a data warehouse, basically a big giant database. Uh, so where was the issue? Well, it's in blue there, the, uh, the map reduce enrichment. And this is a fairly sensible approach to take, but map reduce if you're not familiar with it, can be quite complex. It involves large clusters of data, uh, of data nodes uh, and a lot of opacity. It's not that easy to test and there's a, a fair few problems with it. So how can we improve on that with serverless? So with uh, evolving requirements, which is what tends to happen with projects over time, we realized that we were actually not taking advantages of what MapReduce was offering us. So in the early days, it was a case of we were receiving like billion, those billions of messages and we thought, we thought that MapReduce would allow us to combine that, that data in very smart ways, but with time we realized we're actually not doing that. So this is where serverless came about and this is where we saw an opportunity to kind of re-architect our ingestion pipelines and use serverless. And the very important, the most important concept here is how did we go about it? What was the key thing for us in serverless and big data? Well, we used to have these big data kind of ingestion pipelines. Most of them were happening in, as batch processes about once a day. And we broke down these batches in what we call micro batches. So we fine tune the size of each one of our kind of batches. A batch is a file in S3, okay? And we thought, well, let's do some analysis and see how big can a file be in S3 so that a single uh, cell that function can actually process it within the memory limits, the time limits, and the disk limits for serverless. Okay, so we found out for us that was about a few thousand records. So each function is actually um, transforming up to 10,000 kind of records of data, which is, which is quite good. And yeah, once we did this analysis, how did we go about putting this into production? Well. Someone mentioned earlier in a lightning tongue, blue-green deployment. Well, we use the concept of blue-green deployment, which is kind of a, a put in parallel running your new architecture versus your old one. And once you've made the appropriate checks, kind of tear down your architecture. That's what we did with serverless. So we pushed the production of serverless function. And the output of it was also being written to S3. So we compared the output of the MapReduce job with the output of the serverless functions. And we kept that running for about a week to, to have a bit of a more data for comparison. And once we were happy, we just tore down the MapReduce enrichment. And that's what we've been running for a year and four months, I yeah, think now. Yeah, a bit yeah. more than that. Yeah, so, OK. So yeah, 
a very, very important thing okay, of for us to making that change was actually putting a lot of effort into the testing. Okay, these map, well, no, these serverless enrichments we've talked about, we did them originally in Java. So most of the effort we put was in the unit testing side of things because they were just transforming data. And for some of our ingestion pipelines, the data has about 300 different fields. Imagine the permutations, the possible errors that you can get. So lesson learned, validate all your data, OK? <laughs> because we receive data not only for third parties, but also from teams that are sitting next to us in the office. And everyone with their best intentions, they will always break you. OK, and for us, that means that if a message comes through and it doesn't mean certain criteria or some fields are too long, it will break our ingestion into our data warehouses system. And then everything will just like go, go out. So. OK, all right. OK, our next recipe then is observability, which has actually been touched on just recently in one of the earlier lightning talks. Um, observability for us was actually something that we didn't actually even realize we were doing it until we were actually doing it. Um, you may be familiar with monitoring as we were, um, and we were initially focusing very heavily on, uh, on how our system could break and actually understanding and getting alerts when things were going wrong. But we found uh, over time that we needed to understand an awful lot more about our systems and how they actually run in practice. So. Ultimately, for us, the most important thing was to answer the question, what is normal? Okay, serverless is not, a, is not limitless. Okay, so you have to track at minimum the number of invocations of your functions, uh, also the time that they're running so they don't go over the time limit and your data just kind of goes back into reprocessing. And also, one thing we've learned for us over the time that we've been running is that we are only getting more data each month, okay? So we're kind of pushing those limits as time goes by, and by having adequate metrics and reviewing them over time, it allows us to kind of see things coming from quite a way instead of just kind of reacting to pager duty alarms. Okay, all right, okay. Okay, so we've now got a sort of a, a, si a system that we can uh, test and we can uh, observe what's going on, uh, but how do we sort of manage uh, scalability? Uh, and what does actually scalability mean to an organization uh, like the BBC? And, um, and, and frankly, this is actually the crucial point as to why serverless actually uh, helps uh, solve our problems. And that is the concept, you need to understand the concept of a big news day. So some of those things that uh, happen throughout the year, such as general elections, uh, there's probably one coming up in, uh, later on this year at the current rate. Um, <laughs> Uh, and then there's, uh, well, who knows? I haven't seen the news today. Uh, um, then there's big, sport, big sporting events, and there's things like Glastonbury as well, big live events, uh, and even things like the Royal Wedding. Um, uh, they, they all have sort of like, you know, fairly predictable sort of uh, increases in traffic. So you could kind of handle those with non-serverless-based uh, uh, approaches, because you'd know, you'd know it was coming. but. Uh, then there are other things. There are obviously some very dark things that can happen in the world. I mean, everyone in London knows all about that. Um, uh, but then there's also sort of some kind of seemingly mundane things, uh, such as the, the recent beast from the east, believe it or not, had a massive impact on the amount of traffic that we were seeing. Uh, now, BBC Weather might argue that that's predictable, but hey, <laughs> it was fairly unpredictable to us. But. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't tell them that. <laughs> yeah, okay, uh, but we were thinking actually just before this talk, uh, well, a, a few months before this talk actually, we were thinking about uh, what would be really unpredictable. And at the time, I thought, what would happen? What would happen if England won the World Cup? <laughs> now, when I first thought about that, everyone laughed. Yeah. <laughs> I well, even laughed. We're in the right place as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you do. <laughs> yeah. Look anyway. At us now. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Uh, okay. So yeah, it's <laughs> incredible how much people love the weather. Like we saw an upsurge in like 50% some days, like nearly, on the kind of the data that we were ingesting. Whereas recent scandals, such as for example the data scandal with Cambridge Analytica, we didn't see a huge impact. But if you think that we receive data from users across the world, then yeah, you think that probably it's more relatable for most people the weather versus a data scandal. But, hey. Um, <laughs> 
So yeah, going back to that scalability, uh, this is a graph of a typical day of activities that we have kind of flowing through a, for a web service, okay? The lower ends are about a few, in the lower hundreds, okay? And the peaks can be up to 10,000, 15,000 requests per second that we get, okay? So in a tradition before the cloud, if you provision service, you had to kind of analyze your demand and just kind of meet the highest peak to make sure, and make sure you were always giving yourself some headroom. With cloud, that paradigm has changed. Okay, so now with serverless, we can actually make sure we're always kind of meeting the demand that we have at that given point in time. So that's allowed us for enormous savings in costs, which, which is uh, very important for us. And going back to the micro batch concept that I explained earlier, we work with big data, so we're not in the kind of the real time, okay, APIs where a user is actually waiting for the data to be delivered, okay? We work in what is called more near real time, so a few seconds up to kind of single digits is acceptable for us. So that allowed us to make some analysis and make the files, the micro batches that were being processed by our functions bigger, so that that way we can maximize the bank for a buck. Okay, that's what we call, we're a public service. So we place a lot of emphasis in the cost of our infrastructure because that in the end goes back into the license fees that we get. Okay, so, so yeah, the analysis was what is the biggest size of batch that I can get so that the delay in the data being processed downstream is acceptable. Okay. Okay, okay, all right. Okay, uh, our next recipe then is uh, reconciliation. Um, now, reconciliation for us is this pr the process whereby we take a sort of a very high level view of what's going on uh, in our systems. When you've got such a large amount of data going, passing through your, uh, your services, you need to make sure that you don't actually lose any inadvertently because it could be quite, uh, quite awkward, especially if that's personalized data. You really need to make sure that every, every message counts. So reconciliation for us is the process of kind of looking down uh, from, uh, from on high and actually counting the, all the messages that are input and checking that uh, you get all the expected messages on the output. Uh, and this raised a rather interesting problem for us when we started to scale up our services. Uh, when you're in the few sort of tens of thousands or a few millions, uh, you can use you know, sort of basic sort of uh, brute force techniques to, to count. But uh, when you start really scaling up, we had this sort of question and we, that we had to ask us, which is like, how do you actually count to a billion? Because it doesn't scale as you might think. Uh, it, it really can take a long time. So our first efforts, uh, when we actually looked at it, when we, if we scaled them up in the same way, it would have actually taken 25 hours per day to actually count all the records that we were going through our system. I think there's a problem there. So we had to do a bit better. So how could we do better than that? And well, in the end, we kind of went all retro and sort of went back to the 70s, minus the flares, I hasten to add. Um, and we sort of fell in love again with the command line, which was much to our surprise. Uh, so was there a particular favorite command line utility that you, we came across? I think for me, the one that struck me was Zcat. Zcat, well, yeah. that's incredibly convenient for this next slide, which yeah. is a shameless meme from the early 70s, before the word meme had even been invented. Okay, all right, okay. So, so yeah, remember I mentioned earlier the effort we put into testing and how people will inadvertently break you. Well, the, we learned this the hard way, okay, because every team that we ingest data from has broken us at some point. And when we had our EMR job, it was probably not designed in the most robust way for error handling. So we found ourselves in a lot of those sort of problems as a needle in a haystack, okay? Find the message within the billion that has failed and which one of the 300 fields has failed. And that is not a place that I ever want to go back in my life because it's, it's just <laughs> treacherous and yeah. motivating. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. yeah. What those situations got us into was places where everything blew up and we felt that we could just never catch up. So it's more like you see this kind of tsunami of water coming towards you, like, oh my God, everything has blown up. How am I ever gonna process this data? How have we changed this in serverless? Well, when one of our serverless function is processing a group of messages, if one of them fails, what we do is we take, we, we kind of 
raise an alarm as in there's been a failure. And we take that file outside of the processing. So the rest of the data can continue to be processed by other serverless functions. And we have time to like go to the error bucket, figure out the file. And that's where our unit tests help us, because we can push that data through our unit test, debug it, figure out, is there a problem in the data itself, or is there some sort of use case that we had not taken account of? And it, give, it gives us a bit more space to kind of react to things, versus everything's on fire, do something about it. OK. So yeah, well, now it looks like we're in the last recipe. And I'm surprised, like, why have we left security towards the end? Well. Dare I say it, that was a very cheap theatrical trick to say that's exactly what you shouldn't do. And we should, as we all probably know, um, we should build security in right from the start and throughout. Yeah, so with, with serverless, we, we've talked about how it's a managed platform. And that's a really nice thing, because always patches are taken care for you. But you still have to bear in mind that you're running your own code in the cloud. So application security, you have to take care of it. What we do, we have regular scans through our code bases, uh, and they check against the National Vulnerabilities Database. These are called OWASP. I recommend you check into this. And they kind of signal what kind of vulnerabilities your code actually has. And what we've learned is that if we minimize the, the number of frameworks that we depend on, that also means that our application in turn is more secure, because we will be bringing in less bugs that third-party code will have. OK. OK. All right. OK, so um, that's, that's a, a start, um, but we can't just rely on third parties to find out everything. So uh, we've also sort of carried out a fairly detailed threat model on our serverless systems. Um, if you're not familiar with threat modeling, uh, essentially it's a, a very detailed study of your system to try and tease out the risks on your the security risks on your service. Uh, and also you need to come up with appropriate mitigation strategies for that. Uh, but you need to sort of look at the actual limits of the platforms. And it's very, very easy to get carried away with cloud platforms and think that they are completely limitless. But they're not, as it turns out. And one of the things that we uncovered whilst we were working with our threat model was what we've coined as the cross-pipeline dependency threat. Now, if we refer you back to our earlier architectural diagram, we thought we had uh, several uh, logically separate data processing pipelines. However, uh, there are limits with the, the number of parallel invocations of your serverless functions. You can change them, but fundamentally, there's still limits. And so it, the logical conclusion of that is that if you, you can go back to the, the front end of your pipeline, and you can actually, by attacking any single pipeline, you can actually starve not just that pipeline of serverless functions, but uh, all of the rest of them, which is clearly not a good situation to be in. Uh, so I'll cut to the chase on how we actually uh, resolved that. Uh, uh, we essentially went back to our observability and the fact that we uh, look at our data a lot and we understand what normal is, and we were therefore able to apply individual throttles of an appropriate level uh, to each of our Lambda functions to make sure that we don't, that no one single service can get, uh, can starve the others. Okay. So I think that's bringing us very much towards the end of our uh, presentation. It's almost time to say good night <laughs> at the end of a lovely day, if anyone remembers that. If, uh, yeah. Um, so we thought, how can we, how can we sum all of this up, all of the, the work that we've been doing? And uh, well, we thought we'd return to our ex-colleague, uh, George Orwell, who came up with this, which I think is a really brilliant sort of quote, which is, the best books are the ones that tell you what you know already. And then we thought, well, well, yeah, we could come up with lots of examples of, uh, of, of what we now know about audience behavior, uh, such as the fact that People who live in cottages or on farms really do love the archers. But, yeah. Hey, if, if you know, yeah, if you if know the archers. If you didn't know, the archers yeah. is actually one of the longest running BBC radio dramas, which coincidentally is set up in the countryside. So no surprises yeah. there. Yeah, but, but, but we didn't really sort of want to end on a sort of what's in, what's in it for the organization thing. Yeah, so we want to end it to something. It's something more personal, which is this is about you.
Okay, and we hope that you found some of our recipes and takeaways familiar, but that there was also something that you learned from this. And thank you. Yeah, that's right. All right. Well, good afternoon, and thank you uh, for having me today. Um, this, this is going to be a little bit different kind of talk than some of the other ones we've had. Like, we've, we've had a lot of great sort of theory of serverlessness from, uh, from Erica this morning. Sarah walked us through some of the more practical aspects. Um, uh, Marcus walked us through, you know, what it was like to operate a serverless environment. Um, hopefully, I'm remembering all the names right, and apologies if I don't. I'm just a little...